All right, a real treat this week in our interview segment. We have tracked down a, uh, a a man who has been a part of UCF for a long time, was part of the building blocks of what you see of UCF today. And I think, Mike, I can say this guy played a pretty big role in, uh, in getting one of the biggest recruits ever to UCF. Spent 14 years on staff there, uh, particularly on the offensive line side. Uh, and his former coach, Paul Lundbury, has been kind enough, Mike, to join us on the show this week. First off, Coach, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to talk with us tonight. We're really excited to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Adam and Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you, too. Well, I always like to start at the beginning, Coach. So how did you get to UCF? How did how did a coach like yourself, how did you find UCF? It was 1987, if, if I have that right, you, you, shot, you got to UCF. How did that happen? Take us through it. Well, I, I started out um, – in high school, I wanted to be a football coach. For li- I wanted to do that for a living. So uh, when I, I started coaching, I started. I, I grew up in Iowa and went to college in Iowa. And when I came down to uh, Jacksonville, after I graduated from Iowa, I started coaching at a high school in Jacksonville. And I was there six years, and then I became the head coach and athletic director at Westover High School in Albany, Georgia. And um, Gene McDowell was at Florida State at the time, and he – recruited my school for Florida State. So I got to know Coach McDowell and I liked him a lot. And I went down and worked the uh, Florida State camps a lot. Uh, Mike Kruzik was on the staff at Florida State at the time. Uh, he had just finished playing with the Steelers as, as Terry Bradshaw's backup quarterback. And and so he was there at, at Florida State and he and I became good friends as well. And uh, I was gonna go, uh, I was going to go work at Florida State as a graduate assistant. I spent six years at Westover High School, but uh, I had a—I I thought I had a chance to go to Florida State. And at the last minute, that, that job fell through, and they hired a guy named Brad Scott. So uh, uh, I was going to stay at, at Westover High, and then uh, I got a call from the University of Florida. Galen Hall was the was the new head coach there, and he was looking for somebody to run the athletic dorm. This is back when all the male athletes lived in one dorm and it was actually part of, of the swamp. It was part of uh, the Florida stadium. So uh, my wife and two kids and I uh, loaded up and went to, to the University of Florida and we had a three bedroom apartment on the bottom floor of the male dorm there, Yon Hall. <laughs> and so I ran the dorm and I coached, uh, I coached with Phil Maggio, who was the offensive line coach. Uh, he let me coach the offensive tackles. I coached the tackles, coached special teams with Red Anderson there at Florida, and I was there two years in that capacity. And then uh, Gene McDowell got the job at UCF, and and when he had an open, he called me, and and uh, that's how I got to UCF in '87. Well, so when you walked on campus, what did you see? Obviously, you mentioned you spent some time at at Florida State, Florida. What did you see at UCF compared to what you saw in some of the other schools that you were at so far in Florida? Well. First of all, we knew, I knew, and all of the coaches that were there at the time knew that it was a gold mine just waiting to be mined because it was in the perfect location for recruiting in the most fertile recruiting ground in the country. And football was important in the southeastern part of the United States also. So, uh, and at that time, it was only Florida, Florida State, Miami, and UCF. Uh, so, you know, we had a chance to get some really great players, and we did because they couldn't all go to those other three schools. And while a lot of them did leave the state, we got a lot of them to stay home too. And and so it was a gold mine, and it, it just kept building and building. It was a very well-planned uh, university as far as the physical grounds. Uh, we had a uh, – by, te- by the second year I was there, we had a drawing of what is now actually there, uh, the practice fields and the – football uh, buildings and the stadium and everything. And we actually, it was all woods back then. Uh, we were on the other side of campus, but we would take recruits out through a path in the woods and, and show them these plans that we had. And, and now it's a, it has come to fruition and it's a real thing. So it was a, it was a great deal of fun, but we all knew it was a, a gold mine, really. Coach, I got to know, as you're going through the woods, any animals you guys encountered, any strange creatures that you well, encountered going through the and, woods? There are all kinds of snakes and deer and all kinds of other critters out there, too. But uh, we had a path that we were pretty safe on that we took the recruits and, 
you know, we, we gave them the recruiting line. By the time you're a senior, you're going to see all this stuff and probably use that about eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever not recruit a guy because of the way he reacted to a snake or something? You know, seemed a little screamish. <laughs> I, I don't know if we ever actually saw any snakes directly when we had recruits out there, but uh, uh, I did see some out there from time to time. What were the practice conditions like today? You can't really hit guys in practice. They practice once a day for maybe an hour and a half. What was it like back then? Two a days, um, the meetings to take us through a whole day's schedule back in, in the late eighties. Uh, it was a different time. That's for sure. Uh, we actually had three a days, a couple of years. Um, <laughs> We would start, uh, we usually would start practice about seven in the morning uh, and go for a couple of hours and then come off for an hour or two, have lunch and, and then go back out for a short practice in uh, unpadded usually to, to work on special teams and, and you know, conditioning and, and all that. And then we'd have another practice in the evening. So I'm not sure it was the smartest way to do it. Uh, because I think we, it took us a couple of weeks after the season started to get our legs back. But uh, we did have one thing that, uh, that helped us a lot uh, by doing that, and that was mental toughness. Our players were mentally tough because they'd been through some very physically tough practices. So, uh, and they were full contact practices in the morning and night. So uh, it, it was a different time, and, and I think they're smarter about things now. Uh, but it was uh, we had we had some great practices and we had some very spirited practices as well. And there was no practice bubble back then. So if it was raining or thunderstorms, you guys stayed out there, too. Yeah. You know, we didn't have to worry about uh, getting called off the field by lightning because they hadn't developed that technology yet. So, <laughs> so so we were on there until the lightning got too close for us to stay out there, you know, and there were a couple of times. Uh, one time I remember it hit, I think it hit one of the goalposts and knocked <laughs> everybody down, but nobody fortunately was hurt. But, uh, you know, we, yeah, we didn't have that luxury uh, or that technology. And it's a pain in the butt when you're out there coaching and have to come off the field for a lightning strike that's seven miles away, you know, but at the same time, safety is everything. And, and uh, it, it is what it is now. And it was what it was back then. So, uh, it was interesting. We did practice in some pretty tough conditions, though, at times. You mentioned Coach McDowell. Tell us a little bit more about him, his coaching style. Was he more of a, a hard-nosed guy? Was he a little bit of a player's coach? Oh, he was, he was both. He was old school, there's no doubt. But the players loved him because he treated them fairly and he cared about them. And when you care about them and they know that you care about them, you can, you can be as tough as you want to be and they'll respond. But he was the guy that really is responsible for UCF having a football program. When he first got there, they had a meeting to decide because the, the, the program at, at the time he got there was $1.5 million in debt. And at that time, $1.5 million in nowadays terms, it'd probably be $10 million, you know, but it, we were in debt big time. And so the president of the university called a, a meeting to discuss whether they were going to drop football or not. And coach McDowell had a couple of friends at that meeting. One of them stood up and, and wrote a check to get us through that season. And coach McDowell was the head coach, the athletic director and the chief fundraiser. So during that year that we had the grace period there uh, was when he got to know and, and recruited um, uh, Wayne Dench. And along with Wayne came some other big, big time donors. So that's when it first started uh, getting the big time donors there. And, and coach McDowell was the guy he, he uh, his determination and toughness held that program together, the whole athletic program, not just football uh, in the times that it was financially completely strapped. You mentioned Mike Cruz. He was obviously the offensive coordinator at that point in time. <clears throat> you know, back when Mike and I went to school in the in the late '90s, so we got to see a little bit of Cruz's offense. Yeah. And he was doing stuff back then that was revolutionary, right? I mean, he was throwing the ball all around the yard, which wasn't seen back then. Describe him. You were obviously his own line coach. You were on staff with him. Describe that offensive system that Mike Cruzek ran. Well, Mike Cruzek is is the best quarterback coach I've ever seen. The best offensive coordinator I've ever seen. And I coached for 44 years with some great coaches. Uh, and, and I still say that he, uh, 
I can illustrate a little bit to you because in 87, my first year there, we were not very good in the offensive line as far as being able to run the ball. We couldn't run it for two yards very effectively. We weren't very good up there as far as run blocking. But we threw it. We had some great receivers, Sean Jefferson, Sean Becton, Bernard Ford, a bunch of other guys, Teddy Teddy um, uh, Wilson. Yeah, Teddy Wilson. I forget all of them. We, we had some great receivers. We threw it 565 times in 11 games that first year I was there. So we got pretty good at holding up front in the offensive line. And, and uh, uh, it was – Darren Slack was the quarterback, and he was an excellent thrower. And so we had a lot of success. The second – the next year, we started getting better linemen. And by three years, my third year there, we were a, a run game that was to be reckoned with, with Willie English and Mark Giacone and, and some great running backs. And uh, we, we could run the ball too. And that was the, the strength of Mike Kruzik. He found out what we as a team could do, and he centered around those, those traits. And he got the ball to the guys – that could make it happen. And he found a way to get matchups that would put them in good position. And if we didn't have a good enough line to run the ball, we didn't beat our head against the wall trying to run it. If we had it, if we could run it, obviously that opens up a lot of other things too. So uh, we did a such, it just changed from year to year, but he had enough offense uh, that you could do that uh, easily. And, and he did such a great job of masterminding all of that. And it was a, it was a really a pleasure for me to coach with him. We shared an office, uh, which is probably about the size of their of one of their assistants' offices now. We shared an office like that for eleven years, and then when he became the head coach, he made me the offensive coordinator. And it was it was an awesome time for me. Those fourteen years, thirteen seasons, but fourteen years, I was there with him, and uh, he's still a brother to me. I, I still see him a lot. We talk a lot. I went out to practice last week at. Masters Academy, where he's coaching now. So his son, Garrett, is the head coach out there. So uh, Mike Kruzik, he, he and Gene McDowell are the reason we won so many games in those early years, uh, in the time I was there anyway, from 87 to 2000. We won a lot of games and had a lot of great players, and those were the two main reasons. Well, speaking of which, uh, one of the early wins you all had, I think a lot of people always forget this. We always say we want to beat the number one team in the nation. You actually all beat the number one team in the nation, i.e. it was Division Two at that point. But 1988, you took down number one Troy State at home in Orlando. For a young program, obviously kind of on the up, still trying to, trying to make their name. Obviously, you mentioned some of the things you were dealing with off the field. How important was that victory in 88 over then number one Troy State? Oh, it was huge because uh, it, it – in the southeastern part of the country, it put us on the map, you know, because everybody knew how good Troy was. And then uh, was it the next year? I can't remember what year it was. We went up and beat Youngstown in the playoffs. And Youngstown was the only undefeated football team in the country uh, at the 1A or 1AA level at the time. And and, uh, and we went up and beat them in the playoffs. And, and that, too, uh, solidified us. But the game that really – really got us uh, noticed nationally, I think, was in 1997 when we played Nebraska out in, in Lincoln, um, and we were leading them at halftime, and they were national champs that year. Scott Frost was actually the quarterback on that team. Uh, they had two first-round draft picks in the defensive line. They were a great football team, and what, like I said, Tom Osborne's last year, they won the national championship. And we were leading them in halftime. And as far as national recognition goes, that put us on the map nationally. The southeastern part of this country already knew who we were, but that one put us on the map nationally. So all of those together kind of helped uh, put us on the map at different times in different ways. The week after we beat Youngstown State, it was such a huge win. But then we played Georgia Southern. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, different rivalries that UCF has had over the years. How big was that Georgia Southern rivalry? And they pretty much owned us. I think we only beat them one time, right? Once or twice, yeah. They were really good. Um, and that was a huge rivalry for us. Uh, and we we had some great games against them. But they were really good, and I think they won four national championships in that time too. So that that was uh, that was a great rivalry. And because both teams were good, it, it was really a great rivalry on both sides. Which one of those games that we lost, 
that was close. Do you think that you could, if we had it to do again, you want another shot at? Because there's a couple times they blew us out, but there were some close ones, like you said. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I remember exactly, but we we played them up there one time, and I think we lost by two points, and uh, and I think we should have won that game. But I, I I don't remember what year it was. I'm sorry, but uh, we had we had such great games against them, but it was always tough going up there and playing. All right, Coach, let's talk a little Dante. Obviously, you uh, you had a legendary video that was out on Twitter a few years back talking about the recruitment of Dante Culpepper. Um, so let's just start here. I was reading some some research as, as we were preparing, and I read an article that that uh, that was written, and, and you're quoted in there saying that you were standing on the sidelines, and you heard a ball zip past your ear, <laughs> and you turned around and said, who the hell was that? Yeah. Take us to the first time you actually were on a field and you saw Dante Culpepper. That was at Vanguard High School in Ocala. Dante was a... Uh, it was the spring before his sophomore year. So he was just finishing his freshman year. And I'm sitting there talking to Philip Yancey, who was the head coach there, who I'd known because Philip was a Gator and I had coached at Florida. So uh, <laughs> that ball whistled by my ear and I, I thought somebody had, was close, you know. Uh, and I turned around and Dante's 40 yards away on the other hash mark. And, and that ball it whistled by like he was 10 yards away. So I asked Philip at that time, who the heck is that guy? And he said, that's my next one, my next star, and Dante Culpepper. And that's when I first met Dante. And uh, he he was uh, fantastic, you know, Mr. Football, Mr. Basketball, drafted in the 10th round uh, by the Yankees. I mean, he, he did all three sports very, very, very well. Back in those days, how, how hard was it for you to go up to a, a kid and say, hey, I'm from UCF? Obviously, was UCF known back then? What was that sort of recruiting pitch like when you walk up to Dante for the first time and introduce yourself as a part of UCF? Well, it, it was 94 was his senior year. By 94, we had established a pretty good reputation in the southeastern part of the United States and particularly in Florida. So it, I wasn't ashamed at, at all or even worried at all. I knew that if Florida or Florida State or Miami was recruiting the guy, I didn't have a great chance, but we didn't stop recruiting them because they were being recruited by those three uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one was was Marquette Smith. Marquette, I recruited Marquette Smith, who ended up going to Florida State for two years, but then he came back to UCF and played for us. And so uh, that kind of verified that if I recruit him the right way, who knows, maybe in a year or two, they'll come back home and, and we'll get a great player that way like we did with Marquette. Uh, so it didn't bother me who was, we didn't worry about who was recruiting him or who wasn't recruiting him. We worried about what we saw on the film and what we saw in person and what we saw. Uh, we valued the coaches, uh, the high school coaches uh, relationship with, with him very much too. Uh, and with us. Uh, so it didn't really matter who was coach, who was recruiting him and who wasn't. We just went after what we thought were the best players based on the film we saw and seeing him in person. And so it was a no brainer with Dante. He was a great player. We had um, some things working in our favor. Um, and and uh, you've heard the story about his grades were low at the end of his junior year. So, but when we looked at it, uh, it, he didn't have an F on his transcript. It was just a bunch of C's and a few D's that made it look worse than it was. He was no dummy by any means. He was a, he's really a very smart guy. He graduated from UCF in, in four years and, and did great. So um, it, 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 that helped us when, when we laid out the plan for him to, uh, to come to UCF. That was a big plus. Having Mike Kruzik as our quarterback coach and offensive coordinator was a big plus because Dante's dream was to be an NFL quarterback. And, of course, um, uh, he he really wanted to go to Florida State uh, because of, of uh, Charlie Ward, and he had a good relationship with Charlie Ward. He'd been up there for football and basketball camps and got to know Charlie pretty well. And fortunately for me, the day before I went to see him at the end of his junior year, Florida State had been in to see him and told them they weren't going to recruit him because his grades were not up to snuff. And, and back at that time, there was a lot of stigma attached with major universities uh, signing non-qualifiers and the prop 48 was relatively new still. And, but it was a bad, 
it was a bad image for Florida and Florida State. Uh, we kind of flew under the radar a little bit in that regard, but but still, uh, it was obvious that he could he could make it. Uh, they just hadn't done their homework on the transcript. So when they told him no, it kind of crushed him. And I happened to come in the next day, and I was I was the guy that uh, you know. Uh, resurrected his chances because his transcript showed that he could make it. So uh, the timing was great, you know, but Florida recruited him the whole way. I mean, once I told Dante and Philip what he had to do academically, Philip, of course, told Florida and, and uh, coach Spurrier was recruiting him hard. He called him every week. Uh, Ron Zook was the recruiter that would come and see him, but, but he, but Coach Spurry was the one recruiting him. And, and so uh, it just so happened that uh, things worked out for us. You know, uh, you've heard the story about the trip to Florida. Did I, did you know? I, ha- I have, yeah. But if you, if you could retell it, I don't know if everyone's heard that story. That's a, that's a great story if you could retell that. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he, he, he told me that he was going to go. This was the summer. I called him every week too. Coach Spurry and I both did. But uh, he told me during the summer that he wanted that coach Spurrier had asked him to go up there and he wanted to go and see Florida. And so coach Spurrier set it up. It was the end of September or first part of October. I want him to go up to a home game at Florida and get, get there three hours early so that he could have a sit down one-on-one with Dante. So, uh, it was all set up and, and Dante, uh, Dante didn't have a car and, you know, uh, it goes a little deeper than that because as you know, Dante was born in prison and he had his, his the person that who adopted him, Emma Culpepper was a social worker at the prison and she had adopted 15 other kids. She was 60, but when Dante was born. So when Dante didn't have a car, she didn't have a car. They had to borrow a car and he, one of his uh, uh, adopted brothers and he drove up from uh, Ocala to Gainesville and they got 10 miles north of Ocala and the car broke down on I-75 and they tried to fix it on the side of the road. They couldn't fix it. They had to hitchhike back to, to Ocala and then arrange another car and, and go up to the game. So they didn't get there three hours before the game. They only got there an hour before the game. And later I told Dante it was divine intervention, that car breaking down. But uh, when he got there, uh, Coach Zook kind of read him the riot act. I think what had really happened was that Coach Spurrier had read Coach Zook the riot act for the kid not being there. This was before cell phones and all of that. And uh, so, and Dante was just a yes sir, no sir guy. He didn't, he knew that he didn't have anything he could have done differently, but he didn't really care to explain everything either. So uh, when they got in, he got there an hour before the game and, and Coach Zook put his arm around him and said, what do you think about playing defensive end? And that ended it right there. He got back after that game and called me that night and committed to us at UCF that night. And he never wavered from that commitment. And uh, um, it just worked out in our favor, you know, at the time. Uh, like I said, I think it was divine intervention. There's no truth that you kind of messed with that car the night before. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> if, I'd have, if I'd have known whose car it was, I might have, but no, I didn't. <laughs> so what was it like when he gave you that call? What was your reaction? What was Coach McDowell's reaction when you told him, hey, we just landed Dante? Well, this is funny. First of all, it was hard for me to believe it. Secondly, I couldn't get Coach McDowell or Coach Cruzic to believe me at all. They thought I was putting them on. It took about a week for me to – and finally I got Dante to talk to Cruz, and and uh, and so they, they finally started believing. But uh, – it was hard for anybody to believe because here is, like I said, Mr. Football in the state of Florida, which is a big deal, Mr. Basketball and a professionally drafted baseball player. And that was his backup plan, by the way, if he hadn't qualified, he would play pro baseball. But uh, it, 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 and everybody else in the country had figured it was either Florida or a junior college, you know, at the end of his first semester, though, he, he had done some work in the summer and, and did that first semester and, and was right on schedule to, to get the grades he needed to get his scholarship. Florida State and everybody else came back and tried to, to offer him again, and he just said no to everybody. And that was that's the kind of character Dante had. And Dante's character was what made me believe that it was possible because he raised everybody up on his team, on our team, uh, everybody that's around him, he's that kind of person. Uh, 
just a fantastic individual. Married his high school sweetheart. She is also a UCF grad. Got six kids. He's still a, he's still a loyal UCF knight. How long did that buy you as a recruiter on the staff? You <laughs> just going around. Hey, you know, I'm, I brought Dante here. How many times did you mention that to coach? You know, if he's <laughs> he's getting on you for something. Hey, Lonsbury, why don't you? No, hey, you know, I'm the one that brought Dante here. It's, it's no, that didn't work. Uh, it's what have you done lately? You know, that's what it always is in recruiting. So, but I was fortunate. I had a lot of good recruits uh, that uh, I signed six kids from, from Dante's team that year at, at uh, Vanguard and they all turned out to be players and, and uh, I signed a bunch of guys. So it, it wasn't about how many you signed. It's about the quality of sign. Coach McDowell often said, I'd rather you not sign a player that can't play than sign all these players you know it, it's not about how many you sign it's about wh who you sign and what kind of players they are but dante i was just in the right place at the right time and i did my homework and and had a good relationship with dante and uh it was it was a lot of fun i i, I gotta tell you this little story uh you may have heard this one too but my first home visit with him was of course at emma culpepper's house and uh, we're sitting in the in the living room and I'm sitting in a chair and uh, Miss Emma's sitting in her chair and she's got the space heater going because it's December and, and uh, or it may have been January. And Dante's sitting on the couch and and a, a, a cockroach happened to crawl across my toe, my foot, my shoe. And uh, I saw it and Dante saw it and Miss Emma saw it. And Miss Emma and I looked at each other and kind of laughed and Dante was just white as a sheet. He was embarrassed. And Miss, <laughs> Miss Emma in her natural, fantastic way, just said, hey, you name must be Sugarfoot because of the cockroach. And, and we laughed, and I was Sugarfoot from then on the whole time that Dante was there. I was Sugarfoot to her every time I saw her. So it was – she had that way of, of reducing the tension on Dante and helping him, and, and uh, I recognized that for what it was, and it was fun. What about on the field? When, when Dante finally gets to UCF, Coach, I, I mean, you, obviously you saw him in every practice, every walkthrough, every every meeting. Was there one thing that you saw or a couple of moments you saw that you looked and said, I cannot believe the kind of athlete that Dante is? I got to imagine you saw some stuff throughout practice that had your jaw on the ground. Well, at six foot four and 235 or 40 pounds out of high school, and we had fast guys on our team, he was one of the fastest. He was our best runner. He would try to win every wind sprint. He was the first one out on the field and the last one off. He was the most competitive player I think that we had. And that's how in some respects he'd raised everybody's level of competitiveness on the entire team. And I think that was the thing that impressed me the most, his competitiveness. And he didn't, he never took a second off. He was trying to be the best he could be all the time. And that transferred to the other players on our team. And that's why we had a lot of success. Uh, but I think that more than his physical ability, although, like I said, his senior year for the NFL scouts, he weighed 250 pounds. He ran a 4.5 flat and a 4.55 on the pro watches, which is extremely fast. So uh, that's why it was a first round draft pick. Well, today's day and age, coach, if you bring a heralded freshman quarterback in, the uh, the, uh, the thinking is he's going to start right from the jump. But if he doesn't, he's in the portal probably three days later, right? Take us back to 1995, Dante's first year. What was that competition like for the quarterback position? Was it his from the beginning? Did he have to earn it? What was kind of like the battle behind the scenes as Dante finally emerged on campus? Well, Darren Henshaw had just graduated and was actually coaching with us as a graduate assistant uh, at UCF. And and so he had set a pretty high standard over 9,000 yards passing. So obviously Dante had that in his sights right from the beginning. And we had some other good quarterbacks there, but, and we didn't give the job to Dante, but it was, it didn't take long to, to see that Dante was the guy. I mean, he was bigger, faster, and a better arm than anybody. And he was smart. Uh, people didn't realize how smart he was. He, in our first game that season, his true freshman first game, we played Eastern Kentucky in Orlando. He completed his first 14 passes in that game, and eight of them he checked at the line of scrimmage to get us in the right play. So the guy earned his job 
and did a fantastic job. And Mike Kruzik is the guy that's responsible for teaching him that in such a short period of time. Because we didn't, he couldn't come in early like they do now. I mean, he had to stay and finish his high school grades. So um, I, I got to give credit to Coach Kruzik and to Dante in that in that regard. They did a fantastic job. And Coach Cruz whittled down the offense to, to make it um, easier for him to start out and then gradually kept building and building and building. And, and then we did about anything we wanted to when Dante was there. Nowadays they have the NIL stuff where it's pretty much open. We're paying you to come to school here, right? Yeah. Back then, I'm sure UCF didn't have much of a budget. We don't have that big of a budget now compared to most schools. But you're recruiting against Florida and Florida State. What stories did you hear? And, and these stories have been going back forever. Warren Sapp said he took a pay cut when he went to the NFL. <laughs> what, what recruits did you lose out on? Because schools like that were paying guys or doing stuff like that. Well, there was a lot of that going on. And when I was at Florida, I got there right after they had gone on probation. And and obviously, there were still players being paid there. You can't just cut the, the fountain off, you know, uh, just because you're on probation. <laughs> Those players are still getting paid, but otherwise you'd have a lot more problems. But there were – I know of one, one place, and I won't name the school, but – uh, when I was at Florida, we were recruiting a tight end from from Bell Glade, and he was really good. And uh, I know that there was a coach that put fifty thousand dollars on the table in his in his kitchen, and he turned it down. So somebody else put more on the table. So now, I don't know. Uh, it's it's just different now, you know. But back then, it was all under the table and and behind the scenes, and and it was illegal. Now it's legal. I, I'm not sure it's any better, though. You know, I, I, there's, a, there's some issues with that. Um, when you got players who make a lot of money before they ever step on the field and haven't proved themselves, it's tough in the locker room. It's tough to discipline players. It's tough for some of those players to live up to expectations, too. What was the recruiting budget like for you? You had to go out on the road. You were just – in your own car, you had to pay your own gas. No, How did that work I, out? I started out. Uh, I got a I got a uh, courtesy car. Well, we started out renting cars because none of us could afford to drive our own car. But then I got a courtesy car. I think my first year, and uh, so I drove that. Uh, and we, my first year there, we did not go any further west or north than Tallahassee. We, that, we just considered the panhandle out of state because we drove everywhere. We didn't, we didn't fly anywhere. We didn't fly anybody in. The players coming in for visits needed to be within driving distance. So uh, that was the difference. We had no recruiting budget to speak of. I mean, gas money, and we had to bring receipts back for gas and hotels and, uh, you know, and meals. And uh, so it just wasn't a whole lot of money there. But uh, – you know, we found a way, and uh, the players that came were were happy to come, and they believed in UCF, and we had some great players. I mean, when I left in the spring of 2000, I left right after spring practice in 2000, and I left – our spring game was on Saturday. I was hired by Coach Lou Holtz on Sunday. I flew up to Columbia, South Carolina on Monday, and we started spring practice up there on Wednesday. The offensive line I left at UCF was better than the line I inherited at South Carolina, and that's no joke. We, we had good players at UCF, and um, we had them because there were a lot of good players in the state, and our coaches did a great job of hitting. We tried to hit every school in the spring in the state of Florida other than we considered, like I said, the panhandle out of state. Every school in the state in the spring and the fall at least once. So, um, you know, we, I think our coaching staff just did a great job. And that was a reflection of Coach McDowell and his determination and, and his leadership. Mike Ritadoria was on one of those lines, right? Yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike's a good story, too. He, Mike only played one year of high school football, and he was a tight end. And, but we saw some potential in him as an offensive lineman and as a center in particular. So we recruited him as a center. And uh, – he redshirted his first year, and then he started every game 
the next four years and was a remarkable player for us, a really great player, love him to death, played for several years in, in the NFL, won a Super Bowl championship uh, when he was with the Rams, uh, had another guy, Cornell Green, uh, great player, uh, won a Super He was in the league, I think, 12 or 13 years, won a Super Bowl with Tampa Bay when, when he was with them. Uh, you know, we had players like that, all the Marcus Jenkins. We had all kinds of players like that that played in the NFL and, and Ryan Gillis. Uh, I mean, just name after name that were really good players for us, you know. And so uh, recruiting was, was done well at UCF um, back in the days I was there. It was done right. And, again, Coach McDowell is the guy that's responsible for that. He was the one that really uh, was the – was the main guy in overseeing that. Coach, 1996 saw uh, UCF take a jump up uh, in, in status, obviously going to Division One. As a coach, how big a transition was that for you and the staff to get the team ready for that level of competition in 1996? Well, obviously, it helped us in recruiting leading up to that. So it really wasn't a big transition for us other than we had to play a lot better play teams uh, all the time. I mean, we – we played a brutal schedule, um, but it was, uh, it wasn't, uh, I mean, we competed in every game. It, there wasn't, I mean, we got blown out. I think, I don't remember what year it was. It may have been 96 uh, Florida state beat us pretty good, but they were number one in the country. Florida beat us one year, but they were number two or three in the country at the time. But other than that, we competed with everybody. We played pretty well. The end of that 97 season, obviously, saw a coaching change. Gene McDowell um, left the program, and, and obviously Mike Kruzek gets the job in 98. But we see that today a, t a ton, uh, Coach. We, we see coaches leaving from school to school, and we always think about, oh, it's going to this school and that school. I think what we forget is the assistant coaches are heavily impacted by those coaching changes. So take us into that time in 97 when you realize that Gene McDowell, Coach McDowell, is leaving. You as an assistant coach, what kind of uncertainty was there for you? Did you have any sense of what next might be? And were you concerned about maybe whether or not you'd be able to stay at UCF? I got to tell you, my first several years at UCF, I didn't even have a contract. It was a handshake with Coach McDowell, <laughs> you know. And so I, I always felt like I was always at the mercy of the head coach uh, or anybody else, really. I, I, it didn't really – I mean, it was behind the scenes. I knew that there was no job security, but – um, it came to the forefront then because of the way it happened with the cell phone incidents and all that. But I knew that the best guy for the job was Mike Kruzik. And I just told Mike, I said, Mike, I'll support you any way I can, you know? And, and so Mike went after the job and got it. So it was, uh, I figured I could always get another job. You know, I can get a job coaching somewhere. So, uh, I decided I wanted to stay at UCF and help Cruz, and and uh, I would have stayed longer. But in in 2000, it's hard to tell Coach Lou Holtz no. You know, he's he, he's a pretty good recruiter himself, and and the money was really good, so it was hard not to leave back then. But I did it the right way with Cruz. I told him what was going on, and and told him that you know I needed his permission before I left, and he 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 was gracious to me. So. So Mike Kruzik was the right guy for the job. Uh, I hated to see the way things went for Coach McDowell because he deserved a lot better than that. It was a, um, it was not handled very well, I didn't think, by the administration at UCF at the time. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was bad, and Coach McDowell deserved a lot better than that. Uh, he, like I said, they wouldn't have a program without him. So you left in right before the 2000 season. And that's the year we finally broke through all those close games. Alabama, against yeah. yeah. And then we beat Alabama. Were you here? Yeah. Were you able to I mean, probably not even watch the game, but when you heard the news that we beat Alabama, what was your reaction? Oh, I called Cruz right away and congratulated him. Uh, I didn't, I didn't see the game. Obviously we were playing, I think the same day, but um, now we had in 99, we had gone up to Georgia. Yeah. And, we actually beat Georgia. It, there yeah, was a bogus offensive pass interference yeah. call. Kenny, poor Kenny Clark. <laughs> yeah, it was bogus. We won the game, in my opinion. The guy that made that call was an SEC official who worked at the University of South Carolina. So when I went up there in the spring, I, I looked him up and I said, 
how could you make that call? And he just told me. He said it was an SEC team against a non-SEC team. That's what you get. And and I, 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 how do you argue with that? You know, but uh, so in my opinion, we beat Georgia that year too, <laughs> in '99. <laughs> And there were, there were other times. Auburn we had on the ropes uh, a couple of times. Georgia Tech a couple of times. Ole Miss, Mississippi State, you know, South Carolina twice. Uh, you know, there were a lot of games that we were really close. But you're right. 2000 was the year that they overcame all of that and, and beat Alabama. And that was huge. Uh, you mentioned Hinshaw on the staff with you for a while. He's back now on the staff at UCF. What can you tell us about him as a coach now? Or I, we know how, how he was as a player. He put up all the numbers, but as a coach, what, what's your impressions of him? He's a great teacher. He, like I said earlier, he learned from the best with Mike Kruzik. And um, I'm really excited about him being there because I think our quarterbacks needed somebody that could be with them all the time. The head coach has a hard time being with those guys day in and day out in the off season, particularly because he has a lot of other responsibilities he has to take care of. But Darren is, is going to be there and has been with them day in and day out, doing all the extra little things that need to be done. And I think if there's anybody that can get them uh, more proficient in the passing game, it's Darren Henshaw. And I'm really excited about him being there for that reason. Coach, what are your thoughts on the rise of UCF? Obviously, the last couple of years have been pretty meteoric, you know, undefeated season in 17, back-to-back New Year's six games. As you've kind of watched from afar as somebody who worked there and as a fan now as a former coach, what do you make of kind of what UCF's done in the last five to seven years? We knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. Uh, we knew it back in 87. Uh, it was a gold mine. We talked about it back then that one day UCF's going to win a national championship, uh, maybe more than one in football because uh, it's just too good a place. Look, you know, it's like any business location, location, location. Orlando is the perfect location for a college football team as far as recruiting goes. So uh, it didn't surprise me at all. It, and everybody's done their part as, as things have progressed. Uh, I'm just glad that I got to be a part of it back in the day. And, and uh, I, I'm still thankful that I get to go out there and watch practice and, and get the feel of things still. Hey, you mentioned that you, you get a chance that you're still out there active. You're watching practices under, under coach Malzahn. So give us an early scouting report, coach. What are you <laughs> seeing so far from UCF? Uh, obviously defense has a little bit of change this year with some, uh, some new players, a new coordinator. We mentioned the mm-hmm. offense with new coordinators as well. Give us a scouting report. What have you seen so far that you like out of what you've seen in practice? Well, I was really pleased with the physicalness of practice this spring. Both sides of the ball were very physical. Uh, We have some tremendous, I think there were seven early enrollee freshmen, and I think uh, maybe more than seven, but seven of them that can really play. A couple of defensive linemen, a couple of offensive linemen are going to be great players. Uh, I'm really impressed with the recruiting that's been going on as well. Uh, I I think everything's going the right direction. I think Coach Malzahn has done a masterful job. Of, of recruiting, of coaching, and getting the coaches there to do what he wants them to do. And he's got a great staff, and not just the coaches on the field, but the support staff, the weight room, the training staff, the recruiting staff, even the video staff. It's They're on the cutting edge of everything, and, and uh, it's the way it should be, and that's the way it is. Going to the Big 12 next year, how big of a jump do you think that will be for UCF from a competition standpoint? Uh, it's it's going to be a jump and a big jump, but I think UCF's ready for it. Uh, the, the tough thing about the Big 12 is the balance in that conference. I mean, last year, the worst team in that conference was Iowa State, and they were darn good, you know. So uh, they, don't, they haven't had, the, well, a couple of traditional teams that have been down, Kansas and Kansas State, popped right up last year. So, uh, you know, it's it, it, anybody can win that league including UCF, including uh, Cincinnati, including Houston, including BYU. So uh, I think it's going to be very competitive, uh, and we're going to need to stay healthy and and have some breaks go our way in order to be in the thick of it at the end of the season. But I think we have the talent and the the coaching and the ability to do that if if we're able to stay healthy and and things go our way. I think we've got a, a lot there. I like spring. 
Well, Coach, you mentioned obviously you're spending some time at UCF that you saw the coaches cruise X plural at the Masters Academy. Uh, yeah. What are you up to these days? What are you What are you doing to keep yourself busy in your uh, in your time? Well, I, I went to Winter Parks practice today. Those guys are friends of mine too, uh, and I've been out to Popka's practice and Bishop Moore's practice, and I, I got a lot of friends in the area, so I can go get my football fix, you know. So, uh, but uh, I've got a granddaughter that's uh, graduating from high school and. She played basketball and lacrosse and now softball. And, and so I'm going to a lot of games and uh, a lot of graduations. I got a granddaughter. One of my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, graduated from UCF three years ago. I have a grandson who's a junior at UCF now. I have another granddaughter who's at Mercer University. She's graduating next week, so I'll go up there for that. And then uh, I think my my next granddaughter is probably going to go to Florida State. But uh, uh it, I'm, I'm busy with grandkids and and uh, I'm actually going to to Ireland to play golf in June. So uh, I'm looking forward to that trip, too. But uh, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, it doesn't seem like I have any spare time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll tell you what, it sounds like you got to figure it out. Watching football practices, playing golf, you know, living through the grandkids. Sounds like you've got the secret of life figured out, coach. So I definitely, well, it, it's definitely pretty hope. good. And and yeah. I and all my coaching friends too. I get to see them, and and uh, that's a lot of fun too. And the, and the former players, I see a lot of them too. I definitely hope I can figure that strategy out one day, coach. <laughs> but before we get you out of here, we end every interview on kind of rapid fire questions. So it could be about music, movies, sports, some of your past career. So kind of random rapid fire questions. So are you prepared to face what I think may be the toughest questions of all time? Shoot. All right, so we've had a lot of former players on, and usually Mike actually is the one who asks this question. Where was there a hangout spot around campus? But you were a coach. You were an adult. You had responsibilities, but you were also somebody who probably likes to have a good time, Coach. So where did you and the coaches hang out when you wanted to have a night out and maybe cut loose a little bit? Because you couldn't hang out where the players hung out, I assume, right? So where was your secret spot for you and the coaches to steal away maybe and grab a cold, uh, a cold brown water? Well, uh, there wasn't a lot. Church Street Station was one place you used to go some, but uh, there wasn't a lot of time for that. Uh, we worked. We were working a lot. <laughs> That's what everybody says. I like your answer, Coach. <laughs> Good answer. I tell my wife that all the time. No, honey, I was always studying. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were we were recruiting a lot, and and you know, Collegiate Village Inn was where the players were living yeah. most of the time, and and so we spent a lot of time over there, just kind of marshalling the place <laughs> all right coach this is a great time of year if you're a sports fan we just had the kentucky derby on saturday we've got the nhl playoffs we got the nba playoffs going on right now baseball's in full gear outside of football what's your favorite sporting event the masters golf tournament yeah i, I actually got to play augusta national when i was coaching at south carolina Coach Holtz is a member there, so he took me and a couple boosters, and we went and played. I went to the tournament every year. I coached up there. It's it's a, a special tournament, and a, and it's special to me since I got to play that course. And not not everybody can say that. What'd you shoot? Ninety, and I'm proud of that ninety. That's not bad. <laughs> wow, it's not bad at all. It's not bad at all. Coach, you mentioned recruiting. Obviously, you have to drive around and see parts of the country. What is one city that you had to go recruit in that you said to yourself, I'm never coming back to this place ever again in my life? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I never said I would never come back, but uh, I had one of our coaches, Randy Romero, was recruiting down in Miami uh, during the riots back in, I want to say, 88 or 87. I can't remember what year it was. Uh, he was recruiting in the Carroll City area, Liberty City. And he was in a home visit and automatic gunfire was going off in the backyard while he was in the home visit. So I, I told him I, I didn't think I wanted to go down there and recruit. But I did go to Fort Lauderdale and, and there were some places there. I, I got to tell you, one place I, I went, uh, I, there were two brothers that played at Ely High School in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Pompano Beach, actually. Oh, and yeah. The, the two guys actually end up going to Florida State, but I went into their home for a home visit. They met me six blocks from their house and escorted me into their neighborhood and escorted me out again. That's the kind of neighborhood it was. So uh, there were some interesting places I got to visit. Fun fact, Coach. I'm, I'm from Pompano, so, oh, yeah, so I actually you know. grew up in Pompano. So, yes. I, I, yeah. Mike's in Fort Lauderdale right now, so Mike knows Fort Lauderdale very well. Yeah, so you know. Uh, yep. Yeah. 
it, and it was interesting. These were great players, great kids. Uh, but it was, it was, a. Uh, it was different. There were some, there were some tough times back then. All right. We always joke about coach Kruzek and his workout routines and his guns that he's got that he's not afraid to show you, but you look like you're in pretty good shape yourself. So if there was an arm wrestling tournament among coaches, how do you do in that? Are the guys you coached with? Oh, shoot. Uh, Bob Shackelford would have won it. Bob's dead now, but, but uh, Bob would have won it. He, he was the guy that was, uh, he was just uh, country strong, you know. Uh, I'd have had a chance because Cruz, Cruz couldn't have won an arm wrestling deal because he had a bad shoulder. So, uh, mm. so that, that's the only reason I would have had a chance against him. But uh, we had Bob Shackelford and, and Cruz and I, Cruz and I worked out every day together. Uh, Shaq would come in there and work out sometimes too. He was pretty strong. Coach, we're all spoiled now. We have this nice, beautiful on-campus stadium. But when Mike and I went to school, when you were there, we played at the Citrus Bowl, right? Which yep. wasn't the most beautiful venue I think any of us have ever seen. Do you have any famous Citrus Bowl stories about what it was like to play there and some of the conditions that maybe you experienced playing at the Citrus Bowl? Well, you know, not really about the conditions at the Super Bowl, but there is a story. We played um, – um, a team from Ohio, Grand Valley State, in the playoffs one year, and we beat them 67-3, to I think. And after the game, their coach accused Rick Stockstill and I of scouting their practice on Friday before the game on Saturday. And uh, he came out on his, ra- on his television show and radio show and also in the newspaper and accused Stock and I of, of scouting his practice. Well, we had our own practice at that time out on our campus. So Stock and I were at our practice, and we had 150 players that all vouched for that. But what happened was a couple of guys that worked at the stadium, uh, we had given them all UCF hats and shirts and stuff like that, and they were wearing those that day, and that's who they saw. And those guys later admitted it. That's that's who they saw. But uh, they accused Stock and I, and, and this, this went all the way – to the ethics committee of the American Football Coaches Association. And uh, it was a serious thing because if you besmirch a, a, a young coach's reputation, that might keep him from getting jobs later. So uh, Coach McDowell was very strong in supporting Rick Stockstill and I and took it all the way to that committee and, and got a formal apology from that coach. Uh, and it's a good thing. <laughs> All right, with uh, UCF joining the Big 12 next or this season, we don't go to Iowa this year, but you mentioned you're an Iowa guy. Give us yep. some things to do if we're going to visit Iowa State. What are some attractions we need to look forward to? Well, uh, the big thing in Iowa, but it's going to be before we are able to play, is the Iowa State Fair. That's a huge thing up there, uh, and it's a big deal. But uh, if you go to Iowa um, – at that time of year, you'll see the, the corn being harvested, the soybeans being harvested. It's a, it's a busy time, and it's a, it's, it's a neat place. Um, Iowa is beautiful in the, in the spring and summer and early fall. Um, in the winter, it's kind of desolate, though. So if, if, you, if, you, make a, if you have a game late in November, it could, you could end up in a blizzard. So we'll have to see. But uh, great people there is the main thing. Uh, just a, it was a great place for me to grow up on a farm up there. So if you get a chance, go see a farm. Do you have a? Do you still have a place up there? You still have family up there? You got a place for me to crash in case I decide to go? <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. We we actually sold the family farm, but uh, uh, I, I have a sister in Cedar Rapids, but I don't think she'd have room for you guys. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a wonderful place. Uh, like I said, great place to grow up, and and I I had a great. Uh, athletic career at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa, which for me, I, I played three sports in college, so it was a lot of fun for me. All right, Coach, you know, 14 years of your time at UCF, so this may be some impossible questions, but I'm going to give you an adjective, and I want you to tell me the player who comes to mind when I say this adjective, okay? All so right. first one, strongest. Who was the strongest player that you were ever around at UCF? Ooh, um, gosh, Greg Jefferson, I think. Funniest. John Wuda. Okay. Who's a tight end? 
Most talented. Dante Culpepper. Most athletic. Uh, Dante is in that group. Uh, Kenny Clark was pretty athletic too. Uh, there, there are a bunch of athletic guys. I mean, there, that that would have to be a group deal. There's a lot of them that were really athletic. Smartest. Ooh. Uh, Ron Johnson, the quarterback. He was the Fastest. quarterback in 88 or 89, 90, something like that. Fastest. Um, Je Sean Jefferson was the fastest man in the NFL for nine years, I think. So he'd probably be the guy, although Bernard Ford was right up there too. Who was the guy that scared you just a little bit? You're just a little bit scared of him. <laughs> uh, Probably Greg Jefferson. He was he was a strong dude now. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the guy the first time you saw him, you said, this kid's going to be something? Dante. What's one player that if you could go back and coach him again, you'd love to coach him right now today? Cornell Green. Interesting. Okay. There's some legendary UCF names you had a chance to, to be a part of, Coach. Yeah, Paul Miranda, too. Paul Paul's another one of those guys that could have been the fastest. Yeah. Well, Coach, you sound like you got some good pipes on you. Maybe you can <laughs> sing a little bit. <clears throat> and go to the karaoke party going on tomorrow night. What song are you singing? Uh, I, I'm not singing any song. I <laughs> I, uh, I try to stay away from that as much as I can. <laughs> You've never done it? You've never been on a cruise ship and then sung one not, out? Or on a party? The only time I've ever sung is in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'll take your word for that one. All right, Coach, we'll get you out of here on this question. What does being a part of UCF mean to you? It's huge because of the time and effort that I invested and other people invested, and to see it develop into what it's becoming now and has a chance to go even further, I think it, it, it justifies that hard work and that effort. And I think that's why it's so important to me. Well, you mentioned you've obviously coached other places, and it seems that UCF has kind of a special place in your heart relative to some of those other places. Why does UCF hold such a special place for you? Well, I was there a lot longer than the other places. <laughs> 14 <laughs> years is a long time. I, I was I was only six years at South Carolina and two at Florida, and and uh, I was in high school coaching for 12 years before I ever got to Florida. Uh, all the other colleges I was at, uh, three years was probably the max I was there. It's a, it's a difficult lifestyle um, coaching college football uh, because like you thought we talked about earlier, is there's no job security. There's nothing, nothing that keeps you there. If the head coach leaves, you're out, you know? So uh, it's, it's a difficult lifestyle. It's hard on your family because you don't see them. Sometimes you, you work in 15 hour days, a lot of times. So it's, um, it's a difficult lifestyle, but, I loved it, and I still love it. <laughs> well, Coach, I know we're glad that you, uh, you you wore the black and gold, and you're wearing this beautiful gold shirt now, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, but I know we're, we're, we're really happy that you are part of the UCF family. We appreciate you taking so much time out of your schedule to kind of walk down memory lane and share some stuff with us, and uh, we greatly appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure for me, too. And, you know, go Knights, charge on. <laughs>